everyone. My name is Aura Garcia and I serve as the Vice President for the Board of Public Works for the City of Los Angeles. And today, I applaud you for joining the Los Angeles Sanitation and Environment webinar and for taking an interest in helping save our planet. At the beginning of this year, Mayor Garcetti announced that Los Angeles will recycle 100% of its wastewater by 2035. This is a major step to expanding water recycling and reducing our reliance on imported water. But to achieve this crucial important goal, we need every Angelino's support and help. Installing your own rain barrel is a fantastic way for you as an individual to take action and help create a healthy future for our children and grandchildren. I have served as a commissioner on the Board of Public Works since 2018, and during my time, I have seen a growing interest and passion in our community for rain barrels. I hope that this webinar inspires you to continue to protect one of our most precious resources so that we as a community can work together to make our city a global leader in environmental justice and equity. Thank you once again, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Why harvest rainwater? That's the big question. And, you know, there's so many reasons why, but uh, here's a very, very interesting thing. Southern California, in order to, we, ha we have very little water to begin with for the millions, tens of millions of people here in Southern California. As a result, we only, uh, since we have so, so little water, we import every 24 hours, every day, we import into Southern California about 1.5 billion gallons of water. And the cost on our infrastructure, uh, think about it this way, it, the water just doesn't trickle downhill to Los Angeles, it actually has to be brought to us through pumps. And so what powers the pumps to bring water to Southern California is electricity. So the number is about 19 to 20% of the electricity that's um, made is actually goes to power the pumps that bring water to Southern California. So it's at a big energy expenditure. So uh, we're also going to talk about some of the other reasons why we want to uh, harvest rainwater. Um, one of Southern California's greatest environmental challenges is our lack of water. And uh, the reason why is because we're in a region that gets about 14 to 15 inches of rain a year. That's not much. Deserts get um, three or four inches. So we're, we're almost a, a desert. Uh, Los Angeles originally wasn't made to have this many people, but we do. And so we have to do what we can to make sure that us and future generations have e enough water. Now, the idea of rainwater harvesting is as old as civilization itself. The, we see here a picture of Rome. This was taken last year. <clears throat> it's interesting, the Romans had these amazing architects that their, the drop of water was about a quarter of an inch over like a, a couple of miles. I mean, they, they were so exacting. But the reason why they went through all this trouble is because it, it, not all of Rome had access to drinking water. And so <clears throat> this uh, aqueduct, they call it, um, is extremely important. Well, what was, was important to the ancient Romans, not in use today, but it's evidence that rainwater harvesting is thousands of years old. Now let's get into some of the reasons why we want to harvest rainwater. <clears throat> well, a big reason is that it does lower your water bill if you have rainwater. Another reason why is that it actually prevents erosion and flooding. Um, when you have rain and it and it falls uh, here in Southern California, if you if it rains and rains and rains, it actually hits the soil, and then if it rains enough, it carries the soil into the street and then carries out in the ocean. And erosion is not good for uh, our homes, our yards, uh, because of uh, the idea that it carries it out to the ocean. We're losing uh, good topsoil, which it takes hundreds of years to develop like one year of tops, topsoil. So it's not good, uh, it's good to prevent erosion. 
Now, it also adds a static value to your garden because if you have a garden that actually uh, absorbs rainwater, or we call it a sponge garden, then you're going to have healthier plants and it's going to add value to your garden. Well, you also will collect unchlorinated water for your garden. And the reason why this is important, and let's back up a little bit. How is water brought into Southern California? It comes from basically two main sources, it's a few more, but the two main ones are Colorado River, over hundreds of miles, over mountains. So imagine the pumps that have to pump it over mountains. And uh, from Sacramento. And so the way, the only way you can move water is to keep it clean. And the way that r most municipal water districts keep water clean is by adding chlorine or chloramine chemicals. And so uh, these chemicals uh, do have a, an adverse effect on um, things like wildlife and, and humans and also uh, plant materials too. So when you collect rainwater, you're collecting the purest source of water, no chemicals. And great news, you didn't need to use any electricity to move it into your home area. So, and also too, uh, you wanna retain what rainwater on your property because it improves the quality of LA's river, riverbeds, creeks and the ocean by reducing pollutants. So imagine this, uh, you, you, if you have a lawn, for example, and your gardener sprays uh, uh, herbicide for particular weeds in your lawn, or there's pesticides, if there's ants or whatever, and they're spraying, and then it rains a day or two later, all that pollution from the herbicides and pesticides falls in the lawn, and then there's too much water, the lawn can't absorb. So where does it go next? It goes into the gutter. And, but on the way to the gutter, it goes into your driveway, picks up motor oil and pollutants. And where does that all flush down to? Our oceans, our beautiful oceans, which are um, not uh, doing too well because all this chemical brew goes into the ocean. And so it's uh, killing a lot of the microorganisms uh, that are in the food chain. So the bottom line is that when you trap water in your yard and you save it for future reuse, you're actually helping to stay, save our oceans. And by the way, oceans are important because uh, did you know that more oxygen comes from the ocean than oxygen that comes from trees. There's a lot of talk about saving the rainforest, which is considered the lungs of planet Earth, but there's actually more oxygen because of the algae that's in the ocean. So, so keeping our, our ocean healthy is keeping people healthy and the planet healthy. So by, by preventing stormwater from go going into the ocean. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about, oops, um, we went there. Now we're going to do, talk about rain barrels. So yeah, let's go here now. And this is one way that you can, probably the best way you can collect rainwater is, um, with a rain barrel. So Joyce mentioned the need that harvested rainwater, uh, Joyce, uh, mentioned it earlier. So rainwater actually has uh, no chlorine in it. And, uh, but does that make it safe to drink? No. So we see examples of different types of rain barrels here. And uh, the one on the top left, it's just, it looks like a plain um, rain barrel. The one on the upper right, uh, that's kind of interesting. It looks like a wine barrel. I actually know somebody who does, who actually has, has, they make wine and so they have wine barrels and after they get done with them, they, they actually turned it into a, a uh, water barrel uh, to retain moisture. Now look at the one on the lower left. It actually has, it looks like some geraniums perhaps that are growing on the top. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it's a, it looks like a big terracotta pot, but it's actually 
collecting rainwater from a roof. And then there's a little hose on the bottom. You can see that's actually going out to the garden. And the one on the right is bottom right. It actually shows the um, water that is collected in one. And then as soon as it fills up, there's a little hose to the right of that green one and it's attached to the middle one. That's called an overflow. And so when the green one fills up, then at the very top, then it goes into the next one. And then when that fills up, you can see a little hose that goes into the black uh, barrel on the right. And that goes in, uh, it, you know, it, it fills up and then it has an overflow. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a big difference um, between the two types of rain barrels. And we can see here, this one is a downspout versus the colander style. So you can see that most everybody's gonna have the downspout. That's the one on the left. It looks like a big terracotta pot. Uh, water goes down the uh, rain. It, it comes down the gutter, the rain gutter. And then, and then just, below, just below the lip where it goes in, there's an overflow that it looks like it may go out to another rain barrel or it could just go out into the yard. The one on the right here is the colander style. Um, the colander style is used, uh, especially if you have a, a rain chain, and we'll get more into that shortly. Um, let's talk a little bit about purchasing rain barrels and uh, where you can buy them. They're readily available online. You just Google it and you'll see literally hundreds of websites that, that have them. Or you can go to the big box stores and they typically have in the garden section of the big box stores, they have um, rain barrels for sale. And it's a lot of it is just personal preference. And some of them are made of wood, like I mentioned the uh, ones that were formerly wine barrels, they, you could use them, you could modify them <clears throat> and make them into a rain barrel or plastic. And preferably if you use plastic, try to make sure that it's recycled plastic because uh, perhaps it was used by a, a restaurant because restaurants have big drums that they transport uh, syrups in, for example. Well, in this case, uh, after the restaurant gets done with it, sometimes they convert it into a, um, uh, it, it can be converted into a uh, rain barrel. Now, it's good to choose the darker plastic because if you uh, have something that's see-through, it may cause algae. Algae is very opportunistic, it wants to grow everywhere. And the size that you want to get typically is between 55 gallons, that's the one you see here in the picture, and you can get them all the way up to, the bigger ones are about 220 gallons. 220 gallons is a, it's quite a, a big uh, uh, thing to, to deal with. And um, here's some factors to consider when we are going to look for a rain barrel. Number one is your roof size. And so the roof size is important because if the, the um, thing you want to think about is that if you have a thousand square foot roof, you're gonna be able to capture about 9,000 gallons of water. <laughs> so that, that's a lot. If you have 2,000 gallons, you can double that. Because every year, as I mentioned before, we get LA will typically get about 14 to 15 inches of rain a year. So uh, that's quite a bit of harvesting potential. Uh, then the number of downspouts that you have. Um, downspouts, if you only have one and you have, let's say a thousand square foot roof, um, you're not gonna be able to collect everything. You might wanna put a downspout on both sides of the house maybe put two rain barrels then. So you're gonna be able to collect much more water that way. And then you need to think about your installation space. 
And the installation space is important because the installation space actually has, uh, if you have, you have a very narrow area, but your rain barrel pops out, it's not gonna work. Um, you'll need to make sure your space is big enough. And we'll actually have some graphics on that a little bit later in, in our course here. What are you going to use the water for? So I need to incur, I, I need to, this is gonna be the first warning, do not use it for drinking water. Drinking water is out of your tap and because it's very clean. Uh, remember this rain, this rainwater, it isn't just coming from the sky, but it's hitting your roof, which may have jet uh, fuel plane uh, residue, and it may have pollution, uh, may have uh, ashes from the local fires. Uh, it's got stuff you don't want to drink, so you definitely don't want to drink it. Okay, and then you want to, uh, another factor to consider is the drainage. You want to make sure that once it fills up, it's going to fill up quickly with just one rain event, then where's the overflow going to go to? You don't want it to go down into the street. You want to try to make it go into uh, what we call a swale. And a swale is where you dug out a hole in the yard and then um, it's, it's just for water retention. And we'll see more uh, ex examples of that in, in later slides. And then the aesthetics. Um, maybe you didn't like that grainy rain barrel. Maybe you want something with a flare, like the thing with the flowers on it. So, uh, and the rain barrel itself too, we're going to talk about maybe you want something with, with more of a flare. Okay, um, here's the anatomy of a rain barrel. So, the anatomy is we start out with the downspout. So, this is the gutter that when you have a roof, uh, rain falls on the roof, and it goes into that downspout, or excuse me, the gutter, and then it goes into a hole in the gutter. Then that hole leads to a downspout, and that's what we see at the very top. Now, at the bottom uh, of the rain, every rain barrel, you'll see a spigot or a faucet. That's what you connect the hose to, and um, you can uh, you can open it, and it'll fill up your um, watering can or whatever you're going to water. And then you need a hose. And so you see at the very bottom here, there's a hose attached to it. That's how you can get the water out. And then at the upper right-hand corner, you see a screen. Very, very important. You, you don't want to install a rainwater harvesting system or a rain barrel without a screen because you want to keep out the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are not good um, with a... Uh, uh, rain barrel, uh, they get in there. Uh, there's West Nile, there's Zika virus, all kinds of bad things. We want to really discourage um, the uh, mosquitoes. And the way you do that is by a screen. And then you want to have an overflow on this because it's going gonna, it's gonna to rain and then this thing's going to fill up quickly. And again, you want to have the overflow and on the very bottom, we haven't talked about it yet, but you want a raised platform. So very, very important to have a raised platform because a water, this is not being uh, coming out with a pump. It's actually just gravity fed. And so if the whole thing's filled up, you're going to have a lot of, of pressure from the weight pushing it down. But by the time it gets down to about the last third, you're not going to have a lot of pressure. So you're going to need gravity. You're, and the way you get gravity is by building the platform up. So uh, let's take a look at some rain barrel accessories. So if you really want to get into it, you can get something called a leaf eater on your left hand side. This actually, uh, the, uh, this leaf eater actually uh, catches leaves and they, uh, it's, it's a tilted uh, grate inside is what it is. So it catches leaves. And then what happens is the, uh, it, it get, takes care of what's called the first flush. And so the first flush uh, is about the first five minutes of rain when it falls down. It actually uh, pushes down 
and, and uh, pushes all that pollution stuff. Uh, there's something inside uh, that actually, when it gets inside the, the leaf eater, it's like a sponge. As soon as it gets wet, it plugs up and then all the water, bad water goes out into the yard. And then uh, as, as it gets wetter and wetter, then it um, goes into your rain barrel. So re really great thing to use. Also, there's a depth gauge. So you can use a broom for free if you want. You can buy these things online, uh, but you could just get an old broom handle and you could stick it down there to see how much you have, how much water. Also, uh, you don't want to, you, you don't want to drink this. And so as a reminder, you might even go online and uh, actually you could laminate something. You, you have something called a do not drink sticker. You can print it on your computer and laminate it and then stick it on your um, rain barrel. And so that would be a really good thing to do. Um, also strapping your rain barrel, you wanna strap it down. You know, the more I think about this, it may not be as important if you don't have it very high, but like I said, it makes more sense if you elevate your rain barrel, because then you, uh, if you elevate your rain barrel, then you strap it. Uh, you probably do because we live in LA and what do they call LA? It's earthquake, um, it's earthquake city. And so if we have an earthquake, and now mind you, if you have a 55 gallon drum or a rain barrel, rain, a water weighs eight pounds per gallon. And so if you have 55 gallons, that's 440 pounds. And so I don't think anybody's really gonna move that, anybody any normal person. However, if we have an earthquake, you might get some movement and, you know, 440, 450 pounds splashing over, that's, that could kill somebody. So um, you do, it's probably a good idea to just strap it down. So now let's talk a little bit about the home installation. This is a really good thing to talk about because um, it's simpler than you can imagine. And so here we have a, a gentleman who is preparing the ground. He's leveling it out because you want to make sure that it's as level as you can get it, uh, which means level. And then um, in the left-hand side, you want to pick the spot near a downspout or a gutter. And the reason you want to do that is because you don't want to have pipes running all over the place. So if you can in install it close to a rain gutter, that's optimal. Now we see the rain gutter that's uh, the green rain gutter by the brick. And then we see where it was just dumping into the driveway right there. So the homeowner's smoothing it out. And then in the right picture, you can actually see where he's starting to lay the bricks down. So uh, the finished product should look something like so. So the uh, rain barrel is on top of the, he, these things are pretty light. This looks, it's a plastic one. And this is really a nice rain barrel because it, on the very top, it's got a, of it, it has a little indention. And so if there's any rain water, any overspill, it's gonna spill into the driveway. But at least the first 55 gallons is gonna go in into this. And if you notice the bricks, they're underneath, so it's been elevated. Uh, the minimum you wanna elevate it is six inches or more preferably, but this looks like it's about six inches. And in the right hand, we see the little spigot on top. Now notice we go back to the left frame there on the very top, uh, the gutter is still there. And so it's still going out to the driveway. So in a second, we're gonna see how to actually create the process to um, make the water go into the rain barrel. So uh, we're talking a little bit more about elevation. As I mentioned, the um, there's you wanna elevate it and so Let's see here. Um, the left one shows wood. And 
you can use wood, but I really got to caution you that if you use wood, you are going to, um, <laughs> yeah, what happens to wood is that over time it gets moldy, it disintegrates. Now remember how many pounds you're talking about on this uh, wood structure. It's um, 440, 450 pounds, perhaps around four, let's round it off to 450. 450 pounds on top of wood, constant pressure, and if it rots, you're going to have a rain barrel. Even if it's strapped down, it's, it could tear the strap out of the wall, and then uh, you're going to have a mess on your hands. So I would highly encourage you to do on the right-hand side here, it has bricks or concrete blocks. Those might be preferable to the wood. You can do wood, but I caution you, <laughs> I would think twice about it. I, I would much rather you have the uh, bricks on the bottom. Now here's what you're gonna need for the items you're gonna need. So this is really simple. There's basically three things, actually two things. Uh, you're gonna need a hacksaw to cut the harder materials. You're gonna need, on the hacksaw, you're gonna need a blade that can cut metal because this um, down, the, this downspout is actually made out of metal. And then on the next one, uh, it says to flex elbow gutter. This is a really simple thing. They're just a few dollars at the big box stores. But what this does is it's actually a um, flex elbow. It actually fits, once you cut the metal, it actually fits over the metal and then it'll direct the water to wherever you want it to go. And then the length, you want to get one that's anywhere from eight to 18 inches really simple to do. Now, look at how simple this is. This is the simple operation. We want to measure where to cut the pipe. And, and mind you, the pipe is always going to be hot. The drain pipe is going to be higher because it's gravity fed. So you measure where you're going to cut it and um, put in the middle one there, middle picture, you see it says cut the drain pipe with a hacksaw so that it got the finger there where we're going to cut it, we cut it, and then now that's on the right, that's what it's going to look like. Just a pipe that's hanging down. And then our next slide shows where we take that flex pipe and we put it over the metal pipe where the water comes down from the roof. And then we want to direct the other end to the rain barrel and then tilt it just a little bit so we get every last drop that comes out. If it starts to rain a lot, then we want to make sure that we get the flex pipe, uh, get, get it as much. And if it doesn't rain a lot, we want to get every drop too. So if it's just a real light rain, may be able to fill it up. Now, there's some alternative ways to doing it this way. If you don't it, it, most, I would say maybe 90% roofs have a, a metal spout like we are just looking at. You may not have that. Here's another couple types. Um, if you have a PVC downspout on the left here, you want to secure it to the elbow, at the elbow with PVC cement, uh, glue it in. PVC, you, that's readily available at any uh, hardware store and uh, it's a glue, liquid glue, you put it in the pipe and then you put it in and it just stays forever. On the right here we have an aluminum downspout uh, so you can instead of using the plastic one you can use one of these uh, like you see on the right. And then the one on the left we're going to take uh, another, we're going to get a, another angle of it, look at a different angle. So this is at a botanical garden. This is one where they have the PVC, PVC from the roof coming down. And so it goes into the rain barrel. And then on, as soon as the rain barrel fills up, it, that pipe that's on the left, the, the overage water, so to speak, the overflow goes into that pipe 
And then on the right, you can see where it actually is being secured by some bricks, the overflow, it's going into a drain. And that actually, we'll talk more about this later, but that drain actually doesn't go to the ocean. It doesn't go into a swale. It goes into something amazing. And so remember this, uh, that, that drain is, is a very, very special drain. Okay, now what if you wanna save, what if you have one rain barrel? There's only one thing better than one rain barrel. It's two. And if you have two, why not do three? And so uh, if you have multiple rain barrels, uh, what you wanna do is you set up your original. And so we can see here, the one on the left is green and it fills up. And then there's a pipe, a, a little white pipe between all these rain barrels. But what that white pipe is, uh, and, and all rain barrels should have this, the, uh, there's, you can actually put a little hose, you can attach it with a clamp to the top of the rain barrel. So once it fills up, then the overflow goes into the next rain barrel, the one in the middle. And then once that fills up, then the, it, the overflow goes into the black one. And so you're saving 165 gallons of water here. And I've known people to have, who have over 20 rain barrels and this is called daisy chaining. So it's pretty awesome what you can do. And they, I, I mean, you could theoretically just daisy chain <laughs> until you fill up your whole yard. Wouldn't recommend it, but uh, you could definitely save a few thousand gallons of water um, by, by daisy chaining. Now, if you have a rain barrel, there's, there's nothing in life that's maintenance free. Everything needs maintenance. And um, so there's not a lot of maintenance. It's really easy to do. And um, we see here uh, the one that I mentioned earlier that uh, it has the overflow that goes to a very special drain. Well, here's some things that I would recommend, and we just want to emphasize this. This is the uh, rain barrel that has a strap around it, and it's elevated about, I don't know, foot and a half to two feet. So it, uh, it's important for the safety. If you have it, the higher you go, the more imperative it is that you put a strap on it. And then if you look at the right side uh, photo, there's a screen. So there's the top of this rain barrel actually has a screen on it and it's adjustable. Uh, once in a while, you'll see screens that are made out of metal and after three or four years, the metal may rust and then guess who gets in there? The mosquitoes. So I, I, it, it, well, and if, if it's old enough, if it's 10 or 15 years old, then the fabric, one, the filters made out of fabric might tear, might get a tear, and then you're going to get the little buggers in there. So you want to inspect your, your uh, screens, but you also want to inspect your letters, your downspouts, your rain barrel screens and your spigots because at the very bottom where that spigot is, if, if you move it too many times, it might crack or it might develop a leak. And then after a rain event, you go out to your 55 gallon drum and then it's empty and yeah. Uh, so you wanna ins inspect it. And then also too, a lot of these rain barrels have a uh, overflow control. And so you want to make sure that your overflow control is open and not closed because if it's closed, then you're going to see 55 gallons and then it's just going to overflow into you know, your driveway and then go out to the ocean. So uh, some, uh, we really want to emphasize mosquitoes, how you don't want mosquitoes. You can Google West Nile virus, not a good thing to have. And the West Nile comes from mosquitoes. Mosquitoes come from rain barrels that aren't properly sealed. And so you want to uh, keep the mosquitoes out of there. Keep the lid sealed. And if you believe that mosquitoes have gotten into your rain barrel, then you want to empty the whole thing out. 
and then just start over. And how do you know that you mosquitoes are in there? If you look inside of there and you, you take the top off and you see these little things that almost, they're little squir squiggly little things little, and they're black, but they're real tiny. Those are probably mosquitoes. You, you don't want those. And um, so also you want to keep your rain barrel free of organic material because what eats organic material? Algae. So we, you don't want that. You want it as clean as possible, but it's clean as possible, but as in spite of all your efforts to keep it clean, you don't want to drink it. What you do want to do with it though, however, is you want to, <laughs> you want to water your flowers and your trees. You don't want to use it on your vegetable garden because again, it may have um, all kinds of bad things that may fall on your roof. Break dust. I mean, uh, the things that land, you know, the, the dust that just goes everywhere. It may not be real healthy, so you don't want to be eating this stuff and you'll eat it if you put it on your vegetables. Now I talked about aesthetics and uh, we think of aesthetics and at least in this picture here, it shows the rain barrel. It's green in color, so it's a little prettier than just a standard like gray one. Can we do better? Well, yes, we can. So here's some Nouveau rain barrel decor. Um, the ones on the up, upper left, they're wraps. And so you can actually buy these online. And then uh, you can see where the lid was actually wrapped. And it, oh, what a wrap is, it's, it's plastic that like a car, like sometimes uh, advertisers will use wraps um, on, a, on a car and they'll wrap it and it looks like really cool stuff. Maybe a, a jungle looks like, but they didn't have an artist painted it. It's computer generated. And so you can put a wrap on it. Or if you know an artist, make sure that it's, um, they use uh, environmentally friendly paint for plastic and they can actually paint um, uh, whatever you, you want just to give it a, a flare. Those are really, really cool. Um, the one in the upper right hand corner, that's actually in my backyard. <laughs> you can actually see it's a, uh, it's got the bird on it. And uh, I got that in memory of Ellie May. She, she, um, she actually showed up at her yard about 10 years ago and used to live here. She lived here for about five years. She's something just kept her coming, probably my chickens. <laughs> and so, so she, um, the, the uh, screen actually lifts up. And uh, so it's a rain, it's a cube right next to my garage. And so there's a downspout that goes into it. And then I lift the screen up or, or the, the front plate, I should say, with the bird painted on it. And there's a spigot there. So it's really cool. You can get those online. And then on the bottom, there is a, um, it looks like a terracotta pot. And this is the second time we've seen this one. And this one actually has a um, spigot on the bottom. It's not elevated because it looked kind of funky if it had a if it was elevated. So it looks like a real pot, and it actually has those might be geraniums on the top. And it's got at the very bottom. It looks like it has a uh, maybe a, a secondary hose attachment, and at the to drain it out completely. Then it has a hose attached. This one actually looks like it might have two hose attachments and one that's red and it's on the lower or the upper third part. And it's actually uh, beautiful. Looks like it's part, if, they, if you have other terracotta pots, uh, they could be terracotta or plastic. They make them these days in plastic and it looks very uh, becoming. So uh, those are some ways that you can do it. And then if you were now we're talking about aesthetics and flair, um, a piece of metal pipe coming down your roof may not be the flair that you want. And so can we do better aesthetically? Yes, there's something called, ta-da, a rain chain. And so instead of the rain gutter downspout, you can have a, it looks like, well, it's a piece of chain basically. And so when the rain 
falls down and it actually, the rain uh, water hugs the chain and it goes into the um, rain barrel. And so it just gives some architectural interest, something to look at so that um, you're not uh, stuck with just a rain barrel with a, with a piece of pipe going to it. So um, they're easy, they're inexpensive, and there's the bonus of during um, a rain event, they actually have sound that goes with it. It's a, it's a, it's a really cool thing. So um, now there's other types of rainwater harvesting that can be done too. Now imagine this, imagine that you put a rain barrel in the side of your house and then let's say we get a rain event where we get more rain than usual, where well, you're gonna fill that 55 gallon drum up pretty quickly. And if you do, then um, the overflow has got to go somewhere. So where is that going to go? Well, there's something called a bioswale. Now, this is mostly for prime, uh, commercial use. It uses vegetation and mulch. Basically, it's like a big swale. So, so a big tractor came in and it actually scooped out the middle part. And so the sides kind of come in. And so the bottom is real deep and then it kind of goes up like this, up to the sides. The sole purpose of this is to uh, retain rainwater. So when it rains, uh, there's a roof nearby and there's pipes that push the water into this. And the sole purpose is again, so that rainwater doesn't go out to the ocean. It stays on site to provide groundwater recharge. Recharge. Uh, I know in my area, the local CVS that got built, uh, there's a section of the parking lot that they just roped off and it's got one of these bioswales, which is great. My local library, they rebuilt it and they right next to the parking lot is, in fact, I think this may be my local library. Yeah, and the, the, the sole reason for it is just to, um, to, hold rainwater and it's a it's an engineered dry creek bed so um and it, and notice too you could have just rocks there but in this case they actually put a lot of native grasses so the native grasses are good for the environment and they um, don't need anything other than maybe an occasional rainwater so now what about for the home uh, is is there obviously most of us don't live in areas where you can have this much land to put a bioswale? Well, there for the home, we have something called a rain garden. So, and what a rain garden is is where you basically dig like a long trench, and then you put gravel at the bottom, and then on the sides you put these cobblestones. And this is a brand new one that was installed and you can actually put uh, a boulder now and then just to add interest and the native plants on the side. And this actually you can, what you can do with something like this is you can actually, uh, instead of a rain barrel or in addition to a rain barrel or maybe the rain barrels overflow gets directed into this rain garden Again, uh, if you don't have the room for, uh, let's say, 10 rain barrels or 20, let's say you have room for one rain barrel, then let the overflow fall, you know, let it, let it, let that pipe lead it into an indention like this called a rain garden. It'll be able to save thousands of gallons of water, take it, potentially that would have gone to the ocean, it actually keeps it for groundwater recharge here and that it helps your property, helps the environment, helps the ecosystem. It's a, a fabulous thing. Now this next photo is an actual front yard where the homeowner decided they wanted to have some, really make a difference with the environment. So all the rain on the property goes into not to the street, actually uh, what had happened in this case was the uh, 
pipe that went from the roof out to the gutter to the street was cut. And so all the water from the roof goes into this, um, to the left there where it says inflow. And so the entire place just gets filled up with uh, rainwater. Uh, there's gradual side slopes. So again, it, how this was done, really easy to do, dig a long trench and then you put rocks behind it, uh, on the sides to, to hold the, the uh, sides of it down. And then you put little tiny gravel in. And so it looks like a, like a pond when it's raining. It's a really cool area. And the ponding area is about six inches to 12 inches typically. And then you have uh, mulch on the raised berm. There's a ton of reasons why, but if there's one take, take away from this, you want to save water, you want to put in rain barrels, and you want to put mulch on any dry earth that you possibly can. It's, you're going to help to save the planet if you do that, and that might be another seminar. And then um, there's an overflow. So just in case you get more water than this can can't handle, then there's actually another pipe that leads to perhaps uh, to the gutter, or if you can't hold any more, then it might go to your driveway or your gutter. And so um, we see here there's uh, the top rock, middle rock, uh, it's a soil mix, and then the bottom is drainage and gravel. So those are pretty self-explanatory. And then we'll talk a little bit about permeable paving. Again, we want to try to um, keep as much water on site as possible. So these are called grass cells or, or grass creep. You can actually drive on this. So instead of uh, regular paved driveway, you can actually have a contractor install these, or you could do it yourself. Um, level the sand out below, place these are like big bricks, when, uh, uh, big, they're big cells. And so you install them piece by piece. And then you plant grass in between, fill it with some topsoil, fill it with grass and you're good to go. Also, there's a uh, porous cement that has bigger pores than regular cement. So that's a, a really good option to use. And then um, you could also do divided pavers, which is really great. Now, again, is this anything new? No. Here's a cistern. Uh, this is, was taken in Rome and it could actually hold thousands of gallons of water, actually used to for the old Romans. Don't know if it's still in use, but it's definitely, it's a covered tank, it's above ground. You could also do partially buried or completely underground. And what is a modern version of this? The above ground cisterns. And so what's nice about these is that they actually have, uh, you can do above ground cistern, 530 gallon cistern. And this was taken at the uh, Manhattan Beach Botanical Garden. So it's, it's really cool because uh, this, if, if you can take a look at it, it's about seven to eight feet tall. And uh, this one has a, uh, remember how I mentioned before that there was a, a cistern, it was very special, there was a drain, very special drain. Well, uh, the, uh, th that drain actually has a sump pump in it. And so when the cistern fills up or the rain barrel, excuse me, then the sump pump kicks on and the water goes into this 530 gallon cistern. And the, the, on the middle, the lower green item there is actually a pump that's held with, uh, uh, that, that has a cover over it, a green cover. And that, actually, that pump actually can uh, be attached to a hose and with one button when you have a, the the hose on there you press the button and that actually uh will that 530 gallons will actually have like regular house pressure water pressure it'll actually go for about mm, they're over three minutes we tested it and so at uh this is actually a botanical garden and so uh what we actually did was we uh, between rains, so in order to keep water from going out to the ocean, between rains we'll empty it out 
and then it'll go it'll go again. Uh, so we keep doing that just to try to prevent uh, rain water from going out to the ocean and, and polluting the oceans. So now there's a, a, an overflow. Actually, if you wanted to daisy chain this 530 gallons, there's a daisy chain um, feature. It's a, the upper right-hand corner. It looks like there's a, some type of an orange thingy sticking out there like a cloth. That's actually pond filter mat. And so that pond filter mat, uh, it uh, doesn't allow solids in, but it allows water to go out. So we just thought we'd keep it really simple. And so that's actually used um, uh, to keep the mosquitoes out. So, and then if you wanted to do something really big, you could do an underground cistern where uh, the, before the driveway was poured on um, this, there was some uh, eco ring boxes put down and then landscape fabric poured on top of it. And then they poured the, the driveway on top of that. And so it was a really cool um, project just, and so all the rainwater from the roof actually goes down into here. So it will, siphon off about, it'll, it has a potential to hold at any given time, like around uh, 4,000 gallons of rainwater. So yeah, and so all that water goes on site, percolates down, rather than going into the beach. And then if you wanted to get really aggressive, we, this is our last slide here. This is a swimming pool. So homeowners decided that they didn't want their pool anymore. The kids were out of college and they lived close to the beach. So what was done was it got, the pool got filled in with eco rain boxes. Those are the, they look like milk crates. And then a patio was built on top and then a rainfall on the upper right-hand corner. That's the finished project where there's a waterfall with rainwater and then built a little little fireplace on top and so nice little, little uh, project that can hold about 5,500 gallons of rain barrels. So imagine going from 50 gallon drum to 5,500 gallons. That's pretty amazing. So now it looks like we are going to uh, turn it back over to Tara and we're going to do questions and answers. Mike, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I know I, I learned quite a bit. So we appreciate that. Thank you. And it also looks like we have some fantastic questions. So I'm going to read a couple. And before I do so, um, I would like to apologize at once if I mispronounce anyone's name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible. But also apologies if we don't get to your particular question. We've got some some fantastic options. So I think a, I think a first one, and it's a, it's a question that you um, have actually mentioned a couple of times, and I think it's an important point to maybe remind people, is Brad asks you, Mike, how long can you store the water for after collection? During the wet season, I don't need the stored water. And that's a question from Brad. Mm -hmm. Good, good question. Um, you know, you want to remember part of why you're doing this is not just to store water for your future use, but also to keep as much water as possible out of the bay, out, out, out of the ocean. So I, my recommendation is use, if you have a rain event, then use that water uh, for, uh, it, it, you know, as soon as you can, if you think you're going to have more rain, then empty it out. And then if you think you're going to have more rain, then empty it out again. Um, that's what I try to recommend is to use it sooner than later so you can keep as much possible, as much water as possible. But as far as how long it should keep, well, you'll be fine if you want to save up, uh, save it in the winter, use it in the summer, which you should, you should be fine for that because you're not drinking it. You're not drinking it. 
So yeah, so that would be my answer, the long and short. Uh, you, but you, you want to definitely use it before the next ring event, if you can. Um, so Anne Gore asks, is it safe to place your rain barrels over bricks as opposed to pouring concrete? And that's a question from Anne. Good, good question. Uh, in the pictures we saw that, it, because again, you're not going, you're not going six feet high or anything, or I would hope not, but yeah, you're not go, really going six feet high. So if, if you're gonna go over a foot, then I would say it would be a smart thing to pour some concrete. But if, if you're going a few bricks high, because again, 440, 450 pounds, those bricks aren't gonna go anywhere. So bricks are fine if you're going a few courses high. And another two questions, two people asked sort of the same question about installation choices. So both Mar and AMJ wanted to know how you can collect rain if you don't have gutters. So what rain barrels or how would you install a rain barrel if they don't have a gutter system? And that's a question from both Mar and AMJ. Okay, so you do have a roof and so um, what I would recommend is um, you're, you're, it's going to be hard to do to, without a gutter. It's going to be very difficult to store rainwater. Um, I can think of a, of a few ways, but there, it's, it's not, we're trying to think of things that are as easy as possible. If I didn't have a roof, I would probably create, I would probably put uh, where the rain falls from the roof onto the ground, I would study that and and I would probably dig out a little bit of an indention and put some plastic um, and then lead it into the yard into one of those uh, bio swales or uh, rain gardens I would but you're not well you're keeping it out of the ocean but you're not keeping it for reuse so um, without gutters it's it's hard to you almost can't put a, a a rain barrel in without a gutter. You need it, the gutter, uh, which, which are readily available at the big box stores. You can buy gutters and they have do-it-yourself YouTube videos. It's, which, it's, it's, it looks scary, but it's really not. So Mike, would you be able to use the colander style rain barrel that you showed us without a gutter? Sure, 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 a absolutely. Yeah, you can do that. And if for anybody that doesn't know what it, you know, if you think of a colander, people think of like, it's a thing that like when you boil hot water, you put spaghetti into it and then you, you bring it to boil, then you push the, you put the spaghetti with the hot water into a colander. That's what a, a colander is. Well, they have the same thing for a uh, rain, uh, uh, rain barrel. Yeah. So you can use, typically you use like rain chains for those. Mm. Yeah. So using the water, um, I know we can't drink the water, but a couple of people have questions about the water use. And Matt Hobby asks if we can use the water on compost piles that would then be used in vegetable gardens. And Richard and Jean asked if they can use the water in their swimming pool. Okay, so the... Uh... The compost, yes, and the reason for that, there's many, but if you have a, a biologically active compost pile, the microbes in there, they're breaking down herbicides and pesticides and every kind of side you can imagine. They're, they're nothing stronger than nature's microbes. So uh, I would say um, yes, but you, uh, because you're not, you're not consuming the water, you're actually letting the microbes filter it out. So I would say, yeah, that would be a really good uh, place to put your rainwater is the compost pile. Swimming pool. Uh, you're, you, if you have a swimming pool, you're, you have a pool guy, unless you clean your own pool. And if you've ever cleaned your own pool, you know how difficult it is to keep it crystal clear. And that's the goal is to, I mean, just per, you add chemicals to it <laughs> to keep it clean. Not so with your rainwater. Again, you're going to have a lot of pollutants in there and they're going to contribute to dirty water. So I wouldn't use it for pools. You, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of 
some questions about algae. So I think I'm going to um, read Cindy Sanchez. Um, I think you ask what the problem with algae would be. Does it? Why is it a problem if we have algae growing? Does it block up okay. the sediment? Or? So you know, it's it's not really necessarily a problem more than people get grossed out at green water. Um, algae is actually, algae is actually uh, they're one celled organisms, they're plants basically. And uh, they're just, if you have a, a choice between like, let's say, you know, like a clear glass of water versus, you know, one that's kind of like green, it's, it, it's, it's just not pleasant to look at. You probably wouldn't drink it. Um, and I'm not saying to drink this water, but what I'm saying is it's just human nature not to drink what we would consider dirty water. We like crystal clear water. So algae and algae in a, I know in a pond, for example, algae in a pond is a sign of health, a healthy pond. So it's a sign of healthy water. It's just that you, we just like our water clear. Um, we don't necessarily like it. It's, it's not bad. If you have a little bit of algae in the water and you're going to use it for the garden, the problem is that algae, there's something they love to do. They love to reproduce. And if they get to the reproduction that's going on too much, it could actually plug your system up. I know with the pond, in my pond in my backyard, a little algae is okay, but if they starts to reproduce, it gets really out of control. And then, um, <laughs> then you've got a problem. So the best thing is to try to prevent the algae. And the algae happens typically when it gets hit with the sun. So that's why you want to cover your rain barrel. And typically if you, you don't typically have a problem with rain barrels unless it's in the sun or it, if it, there's a lot of light hitting it, that's where the algae happens is where there's a lot of light. So. So going from algae to the other pests that you mentioned, mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So we have Rosalind, Cindy Sanchez, and Deb Wong all asked about mosquitoes. So Cindy in particular um, also asked, I've looked at rain barrels with screens, but would an additional mesh or tulle screen be better to add on top of the original screen? Uh, the screens don't seem to be enough to keep mosquitoes out. Okay, so that picture that I uh, uh, had at the uh, botanical garden, uh, it was a 530 gallon container. Um, I, I, I went back and forth with myself and thinking, well, should I do a screen, but then screens have maintenance. The, I'm also a pond guy, and so there's something that you can get that's re readily available. It's almost like a sponge, but it's called pond filter mat. And so I stuffed the overflow with pond filter mat. It was that orange thing, it looked like an orange rag, but it allows uh, water to flow through, but it doesn't allow anything solid. So a mosquito can't pass through there. Um, I even, uh, at, at my house, I'm looking at my garage right now, and I have a pond filter mat in my uh, gutters and because I have a, my neighbor has a huge tree and so the leaves fall in the gutters and uh, the, the old days they used before I thought of this the the leaves would clog up my gutters and nothing would go into my <laughs> rain barrel so I'm like well there has to be a better way so I actually put pond filter mat um, so and so inside my gutter so that the water goes in but the leaves aren't able to plug it up so uh, you can Google that pond filter mat and it's almost, it's kind of a spongy material. So you can actually use that instead of a screen, you could even use the pond filter mat and um, that will keep, um, th that will keep everything out too. So, but if you're gonna use a screen, um, if you use a metal one, make sure you check it every year because I've seen, I've been to places where they just rust it out and then there's, it's mosquito hotel. So a follow-on question, and this comes from Deb Wong, who is building her own rain barrel, which is a fantastic COVID project. Um, so Deb's asking for a suggestion on screen size to keep mosquitoes out, but to not significantly lessen the water flow into her barrel. So is there an optimum screen size? And that question's from Deb Wong. Okay. You know, there we want to keep it as simple as possible. There, There isn't... 
there isn't necessarily like, as far as I know, uh, like a universal recommended size. Um, I would say check into either the, it can be a pretty small screen. If again, there's two types, either uh, metal or they're gonna be cloth. Um, you could do one that's cloth, but the holes aren't very big, which is why a lot of people use the uh, screen, um, the metal screen. Uh, the metal screen, the holes are bigger, but like I said, the only downside to that is that they can rust out. I know on mine at my um, own, I also have one of those 530 gallons in my backyard. And so I, uh, last year it started raining and I was wondering, wow, why isn't the overflow working? The, the 530 gallons filled up and then it started overflowing. It wasn't going into my bigger chamber. I have a 5,000 gallon in my backyard also, but it's underground. I was wondering, why isn't this filling up? So I checked the screen and lo and behold, the, the there was a cloth there that it just, it, the cloth actually got so much dust in it that it wasn't letting water flow through. So I had to quick pull that out and wash it out and then it was good to go, so. So Mike, a quick one is that Leslie asks if you could repeat the name of the material that you put in your, that you recommend to put in your gutters. Oh, okay, it's called Pond Filter Mat. Here's what happens, the background to, to the Pond Filter Mat is that when you have a koi pond, a lot of, uh, a pond builders put the pump inside the skimmer box. And so the pump pulls water out of the pond into, uh, into the skimmer. And so you're gonna pull in leaves and fish poop, but you want water to keep going to the pump, but you don't want those solids going in. So the pond filter mat uh, is, is here and your pump is right here. And so it's pulling water through. And so uh, it'll trap all these solids, and but it'll let water go through. And so um, it's one of the blessings of the you know pond industry is that they've come up with this pond filter mat. And so yeah, I put it in my gutters because I'm like every year I did like several times a year just blow out my gutters. I'm like man, I, I don't want to <laughs> if I fall, I'm, a, I'm done. So uh, yeah, I haven't had to clean my gutters out yet. So I do have leaves on the top of the pond filter mat, but it's um, but it's great because I don't have to like blow the whole thing out. I just, you know, the, the leaves fall over the gutter usually uh, anymore. They, yes, that might be another thing to think about. Pond filter mat, it's, I don't even know the name, just, uh, I mean, brand name, just pond filter mat, Google that. And, Thank you. Uh, keep it clean. So, so we have a couple of questions from a couple of people about pumping, whether they should use pumps. So I'm going to read Dennis Melas's question about what the what is the best transport system to get your water to your garden when your downspouts and your barrels are far away? Should I use a pump? And I know Colby Olds had also asked about pumps and if there may be solar pumps that one could use. Okay, so... Uh, we'll take the last question first. So solar pumps are, um, the technology isn't quite there yet. It, it, they break down a lot. I, I, I'm a, as a professional, I, I'm out, I'm testing everybody's pumps uh, because we build koi ponds and rainwater harvesting systems. And uh, the, as far as like a, a, it's a direct current. So you have this solar panel and then you have it directly connected to the pump. Um, no, it, it, the, it's just not there. The technology is just not there yet. You, you might be wasting your money. I hate to wait. You better to put solar on your house and then plug it into the current and then you can control it. Cause you can't really control these solar pumps easily. You can't really control them easily. So I, so uh, no to that one. And then as far as a uh, pump for, if, if your rainwater harvest systems away, well, that would be another uh, webinar because the answer is yes, but it's, it's much more involved. This is more simple. I would say this one, this webinar is about simplicity and um, you can raise it up. And then uh, what I do with uh, my one next to my garage, the one with the peacock on it, um, I've raised it up and I just put my watering can underneath it and I just water my plants with it. Yeah. So water minded 
Um, Waterminded asks, when rainwater runs off my roof and into the my rain gutters, it often has small rocks or sand from the roofing material. Mm -hmm. How do you siphon off these from filling the bottom of your rain barrel or cistern? And that's a question from Waterminded. Okay, so um, that's a good question. Now, if you notice the bottom of a rain barrel, actually, you know, it's, it's round at the bottom or square, or whatever, but they always, at the very bottom, it's always shaped like, like that. And, you know, the whole, the roundness is shaped like that. Um, that's specifically made by manufacturers so that if you do have a little bit of, of debris from the roof, that heavy, those, those the little pebbles, even though they're tiny, they're heavy, they'll drop to the very bottom and actually help to weigh down your rain barrel and keep it anchored down. And uh, the part where I mentioned about how everything needs maintenance is um, that's where the time where you maybe want to unstrap it, pull the whole thing out in the summertime once you've emptied it out, and then just kind of clean out all that crud and then, um, then put it back and restrap it and you're good to go. So moving to rain gardens, we have a couple of questions about rain gardens. So. Mm -hmm. Will Morris asks, if I put a swale or rain garden in my yard, can it be close to and among mature tree roots? Or do I need to worry about causing tree or root rot? And that's a question. Okay. Good question. I love how you brought in the idea of trees. I'm also a tree guy, so I'm a certified naturalist. So this, <laughs> I'm putting that hat on right now. So. Uh, mind you, a, a rain garden is going to go down like six inches to maybe 12 inches. Uh, you're going to dig down the V like that. And so, or actually you're going to make a trench like that. I would not uh, put it around a tree because a tree is more than just the above ground. It's got this huge network of roots underneath the ground. And if you cut those, you're, you're very likely to cut into some major feeder roots. The major feeder roots are toward the top of the soil. Uh, it has, the tree roots also have anchor roots that go really deep down, but the feeder roots are right there, right by the surface. So if you cut those feeder roots, the tree can't eat and you risk um, damaging or possibly killing your tree. So I would recommend not doing it. Um, now there's, um, your, your tree, you can actually lead, lead it up to where the tree, let's say where the tree canopy is, you're safe there, but I wouldn't do it real close to the tree. I try to keep it as, as away from the tree as possible. Yeah. Um, Marilyn Cassidy asks, is there a way to do a rain garden on a slope? Marilyn Cassidy's question. So, um, you know, what I did, that's a good, and we just because of the scope of this webinar, we didn't have um, a lot of time to uh, talk about this, but my front yard is on a slope. And so what I did with my front yard was I actually uh, did do, yeah, did do some, some rain gardens. I kind of sloped it down. And then at the very bottom, just where, just before the sidewalk, I dug down real deep and I put some of these things called eco rain boxes. They look like milk crates. And you know, you probably could actually do an old milk crate. Uh, but you got to cover it with landscape fabric. Uh, so dig it down deep, like about, I don't know, about three feet deep, and then put, uh, put some landscape fabric on top and then put gravel on top of that. And so that thing can hold about 33 gallons of water. If you put three of them, that's almost a hundred gallons of water you could use, you, you have for groundwater recharge. So instead of going to the ocean, it's staying right on your property. So. I hope that answered it. I know we didn't have a lot of time to get into the re eco rain boxes, but that's another way to add additional water underneath the ground. So, so going back to rain barrels, um, a couple of people have all asked and all made a very, very apt comment about the placement of spigots on commercial rain barrels. So Andy C, Miriam Backrach and Deb Wong all make comments about the fact that the spigot seems to be quite high up, often about a third of the way up on a rain barrel, which means they find it very tricky to access that bottom third 
of their rain barrel. So do you have any suggestions for how they deal with this design possibly? Okay, yeah, that's a design flaw. It's because mm -hmm. people want to, you know, they want to get, the, it's where it's, we're come to the point in rain barrels in our society that it's becoming more and more about aesthetics than it is about functionality. My advice would be that what you could do is um, the simplest thing is you could actually drill through like toward the bottom of the rain barrel and you can have these hose bibs that just screw into the plastic, but you got to kind of, you know, um, uh, you got to link up, you know, the hole with, you know, make sure you don't make it too big of a hole then you, you know, <laughs> there's nothing to screw into. So um, I would say, or, or maybe have a handyman, just, you know, put a hole in and then just put a, put something down there. Then you can get access to it. But uh, get, and, and part of this comes because um, it, it looks kind of funky if it's elevated. It just, it just takes away from the aesthetic. So what manufacturers are doing now, put it higher up, but then it kind of defeats the purpose. How do you get it out of there? So I would say do a secondary tap toward the bottom so that you can at least have access to the bottom. Um, and then usually that's more that what's happening is that's more on like the really decorator ones, not necessarily on the, the old style uh, ones, which didn't care so much about aesthetics, but it was more about functionality. So if you can, to avoid having to do that, look for the ones where it's at the very bottom, the, the hose bit. Um, so Melanie Harari asks that, you mentioned we shouldn't be using the water on our vegetable gardens. And if you could just give a reason again why, because um, AMJ wanted to know if pollution gets absorbed through the, the root system. And then Mel Melanie says, if we can't use it on our vegetable garden, can we put them on our fruit trees, this water? So that's oh. sort of a combined question from Melanie and AMJ. Okay. So uh, fruit trees, absolutely. Because you're not eating the fruit tree, you're not eating the leaves, you're just eating the fruit, which is, yeah. So that, that, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, vegetable gardens, I'm a big vegetable garden grower. I have tons of vertical gardens and stuff. Uh, but in vegetable gardens, you actually do eat the kale or the lettuce or the tomatoes. And if you remember, this is, uh, I live by LAX airport. It's a couple miles away from me. And I understand that airplanes let out jet fuel plane, jet fuel, if they have too much, they just whoosh and it all just kind of dissipates. Where does all that stuff go? Uh, on our roofs, um, when you have brake dust and you have auto exhaust pollution, if you, Think about this, when, when you don't wash your car for a week or a month or a year, can you imagine the grime buildup on your, on your car? Well, that's what happens on your roof. So when it rains, all that grime gets pushed down, all that pollutant, all that chemicals get pushed down and it goes in, into your rain barrel. So if all that, that nasty chemical stuff goes in your rain barrel, and then you water your strawberries or your, your kale or your lettuce, guess what you're eating? So, uh, you know, so many times people, you know, they, uh, they, they uh, are counting calories when they should be counting chemicals. Yeah. So that's why. So, so I think this is our last sort of group of questions. Um, Yogesh Shah says he has eight gutters, seven to eight gutters. Is it advisable to buy barrels for all of them? And then we had Twee and Monica ask if you could repeat how much they could anticipate saving if they have a thousand square foot roof. So Yogesh wants to know if you should have a rain barrel or every gutter and Twee and Monica would ask if you could just repeat that idea and rough calculation for people to know how much okay. water you can save. And this is then our last question. We unfortunately have to get to all of them, but it's a good, good. closing good. point. Okay, so if you have seven downspouts, I would say get seven rain barrels. If you, if you can, if you can, I would say, yeah, that would be fabulous. Then you're saving one, two, three, 
you're saving upwards of 400 gallons of water. That's a, that's a big load of water there. And you're keeping it out of the ocean. Remember, the back of your mind, you have to keep thinking, save the planet, save the ocean. I can do my part by getting the rain barrel. That's, that's amazing. And what was the other question? So Twee and Monica just wanted to ask if you could repeat the calculation for how to know if they have a thousand square foot roof, how much approximately gallons they could collect in a year. Okay. Well, I wanted to keep the math out as possible because <laughs> I know with some of us, your eyes just kind of glaze over, you know, that during the headlight type of thing. Okay. So th this is as technical as I'll get, but <laughs> if you have a thousand square foot roof, you, uh, for every inch of rain that falls, you can save 600, roughly 625 gallons to 650 gallons of rainwater. So uh, Los Angeles historically has had over the last hundred years, averaged about 14, almost 15 inches of rain per year. So that means that um, for every, uh, uh, every if, you're, if you're able to save 600, let's say in 50 gallons of water, 625, then you're going to be able to save about 9,000 gallons of water if you have a thousand square foot roof. That's uh, my, I, I, in my backyard, I, under my patio, I have a five, actually it's about 5,500 gallons of rainwater harvesting system. I, I had a pool there. I filled in the pool with this big tank. And so all my rainwater is diverted there. Um, that fills up uh, twice on the average year, mm -hmm. over the year. So, but that, but um, they, uh, I'm hoping that anybody that sees how simple it is to save water will, will get a rain barrel and eventually it's going to lead you to getting two or three. Then eventually you're going to do maybe those, one of those big 500 gallon ones. And then eventually you'll, you know, want to do like a 5,000 gallon. I think if everybody does this, imagine how much rain we're going to be able to keep, or polluted rainwater we'll keep out of the ocean and um, we'll be able to reuse it. It's what a wonderful thing. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, I know you've got many, many years of experience in this world. So we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. And I also really appreciate all the fantastic questions we've had from attendees. It's They've been, they've touched on a lot of topics and I think we could keep going. So if you haven't had your question answered, please feel free to email us. And Mike, if you go to the next slide, we'll have your an email address you could send questions to. Um, so this email address, send any questions that haven't been answered. Also, if you are inspired and you actually really want to jump to the system level, um, we can help you in this situation. So send your questions and we can direct you to city resources for how to get systems installed. Um, a couple of people asked about rebates. And so again, just a reminder, we'll send you the website if you're a city of Los Angeles resident and you get your water from LADWP and that will have all the rebate information on it. If you don't live in the city of LA or you don't get your water from that water district, Look at your local water district for your rebate options. And most of them will have very clear websites for you to, to find out how to apply and what the rebate scales are. So thank you again. It's been a wonderful webinar and we will have a quick survey now. It's one minute just to ask how we can improve future ones. So good luck with installing your rain barrel. Send, send us an email if you have any questions and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Thank you everyone.